so hi everybody, I'm Naomi Gristel and welcome to uh, the Northampton Neighbor Speaker Series. Um, I am a board member and on the Speakers Committee and um, I want to tell you just a little bit about Northampton Neighbors for those of you who don't know. Um, it's the group that sponsors this event and it is an organization that helps people age in place. Um, we have about 900 members, more than 900 members. Um, it's an all volunteer organization, except for one administrator, um, Diane Porcello, who is wonderful. Um, and we offer services and social events, at least we did pre pandemic. Anyone can join, uh, it's free. Um, but you have to be 55 years or older to get our services. Um, we're part of an international uh, village movement that is pursuing the same goals of helping all of us agents at place. Um, we had to curl, curtail many of our services because of the pandemic, but we kept some of them going, including, of course, this, this series. So what I want to do is just tell you a little bit about the logistics and then introduce you to our main event, Doug Amy. Um, First, we will, Doug will talk for about 30 to 35 minutes, and um, then we'll follow that with questions and answers. Um, if you have a question during the talk, uh, you, can, you can put it in chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. Just click on it and then put your question and then hit enter, because it won't appear unless you hit enter. And um, it's probably better if you hold your question until Doug is finished, because he might cover what you're going to say. Um, but if you don't want to wait, put it there and we'll get to it. I'll moderate the questions after he finishes. Second, if you look at the upper part of your left corner of your screen, you'll see something called Otter. And you can click on that. It's a pretty amazing transcription program that will transcribe as people talk so you can see captions if you don't want to just or can't just listen um, and it does an excellent job um, as nina said we, we will record this um, and it will appear because nina Nat magically places it there um, in youtube and you can go look at the recording afterwards or tell other people about it this, this wonderful event and she's gonna she muted everybody and she'll unmute us as we go to chat um and now to the main event doug amy he is a professor emeritus at mount Holyoke college where he's taught since the 1980s and he was a recipient of the college's marabeth e cameron faculty award for scholarship in recognition of his work as a researcher and public intellectual, and that he is. He has lots of off-cited articles as well as books, one of which appeared from Columbia University Press in a second edition because it was so widely read and used. Um, he writes op-eds, he writes affidavits um, for voting rights suits, suits in the US and Canada, and he has written and given many talks on alternative voting systems, proportional representation, um, and the plight of third party candidates. Um, some of you probably heard him give a talk at the Northampton Neighbor Circle on our recent ballot questions. He's also a musician, a very good cook, and he makes really fabulous cocktails to, to name a few of his many talents. He won't let me list them all. Um, He's going to talk about some of the issues addressed on his now popular second website called Second Rate Democ Democracy. We will put links to it later. Um, 17 Ways America is Less Democratic Than Most Other Western Democracies and How We Can Do Better. He will talk about how many of our American political institutions, in contrast to those of many other countries, work to undermine democracy. And he's going to focus on the separation of powers, which is so often touted, but he's going to talk about how maybe it shouldn't be so often touted. But I also want to just take the opportunity to tell you about another website of his, which has had over 2 million visitors called Government is Good, an unapologetic defense of a vital institution, um, which defends the role of modern democratic govern government and furthering the public interest. We'll, we will also put up the link for that, or at least a URL for that after his talk. So it is my great honor to introduce Doug Amy. You're on. Well, thank you, Naomi. That was a very, uh, very kind introduction. 
Um, and uh, hello, everyone out there in Zoom land. Um, I'm very happy that you could uh, join us today. As Naomi mentioned, uh, the talk I wrote for today is, is going to be taken from uh, this new web project that I, I put up this fall called uh, Second Rate Democracy. So I'll spend the first few minutes talking a little bit about sort of some of the main themes of that site. Um, and I'll mention some of the ways that uh, democracy is failing in the United States, some of the ways we're falling behind other countries uh, in terms of democracy. And then, uh, as she mentioned, I'm going to uh, spend most of the talk focusing on one particular institutional failure um, of American democracy uh, that doesn't get a lot of attention, um, and that's uh, the separation of powers. Um, I think it's very important, but as I said, it doesn't seem to get much discussion, so I thought it'd be interesting to talk with you there today about that, that particular topic. Uh, okay, so let's get started here. Many Americans were justifiably concerned about the threats that President Trump posed to our democracy. He undermined the rule of law, intimidated the free press, he attacked civil liberties, he tried to overturn the results of a legitimate election, and most infamously, he urged a violent mob to storm the Capitol building. Fortunately, Trump is no longer president. But unfortunately, there are many serious threats to, to our democracy that still remain. Most of the democratic failings of the American political system do not primarily result from the schemes of bad politicians. They are instead located in the very institutions of government itself. Institutions like the Senate and the Electoral College. Only by reforming these institutions can we create a truly democratic system of government. The problem is that the United States is the country that democracy left behind. At its founding, we were on the cutting edge of democracy. Our constitution rejected rule by kings. Uh, we pioneered democratic innovations like civil liberties. But in the 200 years since, democratic institutions have continued to evolve with improvements in legislatures, elections, the courts, party systems, and so on. Other Western nations with more modern constitutions, often adopted in the 20th century, have taken advantage of these institutional advances and made their democracies fairer, more representative, and more accountable to their citizens. Our political system with this 18th century constitution has become outmoded and less democratic than it could be. It has become second rate. Americans like to brag that we have the oldest constitution in the Western world, and that's true. But this is like bragging that your phone has the oldest operating system. Democracy has moved on and improved, but we have not. We are stuck with a set of antiquated political institutions and as a result, we have a political system crippled by gridlock, plagued by minority rule, and dominated by special interests. Let me give you a few examples of how far we've fallen behind on the democracies. And I'm going to share my screen here, some PowerPoints. So here are some of the institutional problems that I talk about uh, on the website. Uh, one of the most obvious ones is the Electoral College. Now, uh, it's, serious, it's a serious problem uh, in any kind of uh, democratic sense. It allows a minority of voters to choose the president. Not too surprisingly, no other country in the world uses an Electoral College to choose its leaders. Um, uh, let's, let's turn to the Senate. Um, the, our Senate has a filibuster. It allows 41 senators to block most bills favored by large majorities of Americans. And these senators may represent states that have as little as 10 or 11 percent of the American voters. Not very democratic. Other major democracies, no other Western democracy has a filibuster. Staying on the Senate, uh, we have a rule that there's two senators per state. But this exaggerates the power of small rural states who represent a minority of the voters. For example, 
uh, the 40 million voters in liberal, uh, multicultural California, those 40 million voter voters get two senators. 40 million voters who live in the 22 smallest states, which are predominantly white, rural, and conservative, those 40 million people get 44 senators. No other Western democracy has a legislative body that is so misrepresentative of the public. Uh, let's talk about voting systems. We have an 18th century winner-take-all voting system. One of its problems is that it allows gerrymandering, which enables parties to win often many more seats than they deserve. Almost all other Western democracies use more modern voting systems like proportional representation that makes gerrymandering impossible. Just can't do it. They don't have that problem. Another problem with our voting system is that it helped to create and maintain our two-party duopoly. This despite the fact that polls show that 50, 60, 70 percent of Americans say they want to see other parties besides the two major parties. Most other Western democracies, as I, as I said, I use other voting systems like proportional representation and PR creates multi-party systems and multi-party legislatures that more accurately represent the range of political opinion among the electorate. So I think that's, that's quite an advance. Let's go to the Supreme Court. Uh, this is the most uh, recent picture I could find, but um, we still appoint Supreme Court justices for life. And they rule over US, uh, rule over us, excuse me, decades after their appointing presidents are out of office. It's not true in most other uh, major democracies. Virtually all of the other democracies now subject their justices to term limits or age limits or both, you know, which I think makes a lot of sense. Campaign finance, we still rely on private money. Uh, and this allows rich corporations and wealthy uh, conservatives to dominate the financing process. Other major uh, democracies have taken another path. They rely much more on public financing. They use a lot of free media. And many of them have strict controls on private contributions. And finally, we have our constitution. It's not only the oldest one, it's the hardest constitution to change in the world. And this makes constitutional reform extremely difficult, even when supported by large majorities of citizens. It's very easy to block a uh, constitutional amendment. It takes only a little more than a third of the House or a third of the Senate, a little more than a quarter of the states uh, to block any change. So we really have minority rule in this country. Other major democracies make amending constitutions easier, facilitating the adoption of needed reforms. Most require only the approval of one legislative body, and most don't have that, the hurdle of state approval that we do. All these institutional problems serve to undermine democracy and the public interest in the United States. And they give excessive power to Republicans and the corporations and wealthy Americans whose interests they promote. By the way, uh, there are articles discussing each of these uh, problems that I cited earlier and others uh, on my website if you want to look at them in more detail. Many of you probably already know about many of these political problems. But I'd wager that few of you are aware that most other major democracies don't suffer from these democratic failures, or just how far we've fallen behind these other democracies. Today, I would like to focus on one of our unique institutional problems that often gets little attention, but that is a major cause of our failing democracy, the separation of powers. The claim that the separation of powers is a problem might strike you as odd. In fact, many Americans on both the left and the right believe that you can't have a real democracy without a separation of power. But as you will see, this is not true. Most other major democracies get along just fine without a separation of powers. So let me remind you what, what the basic elements of our system are. So I'm going to go to screen share again. So, OK, so we have a separation of power system. What does that mean? Well, we have a division of legislative, administrative, and judicial functions, the three separately elected and independent branches. So power is divided. 
checks and balances. Each branch can block the actions of the other. And we have a bicameral legislature with two houses of equal power. Growing up in this system, many Americans believe this is just how democracy works. But in fact, most Western democracies don't work this way. Almost all of them have rejected this system and use instead a parliamentary system, which has very different characteristics. Let's, let's look at what the differences are. First, there's overlap between the legislative and the executive, not completely separate. The prime minister comes from parliament and is elected by parliament. And the cabinet ministers come from parliament as well. So, so power, instead of being divided, is, is consolidated. Because of that, cooperation and coordination between the branches is the norm in these countries, rather than the conflicts and checks that you see in the US. And finally, most of the Western democracies are unicameral, or what we call effectively unicameral. And that, what that means is that they have a relatively powerless upper house, uh, like the House of Lords in Great Britain. Out of the 20 leading democracies, only three others, Australia, Italy, and Switzerland, have a strong bicameral system like the US. So when it comes to a separation of power system, the US is really an outlier. Out of the 20 leading Western democracies, 13 of the 20 have almost no separation of powers. Five have some separation of powers. And only one, Switzerland, has a full separation of powers system as in the United States. So we need to ask ourselves this question. The separation of powers is so crucial to democracy. Why have virtually all the other advanced democracies chosen to not adopt it? The answer is, our system brings with it a lot of serious political drawbacks, problems that parliamentary democracies avoid. So let's look at what some of these political problems are. One of the most damaging drawbacks of a separation of powers model is the strong tendency toward gridlock. This problem has been known for some time. Writing in 1884, the future president, Woodrow Wilson, castigated this system as, quote, a grievous mistake, end quote, by the founding fathers. And he warned that it was a prescription for, quote, paralysis and stealing. The reason that the separation of power systems tends to fall into gridlock is really very simple. It takes three, three separately elected bodies, the House, the Senate, and the presidency to approve any law. More often than not, different parties control these different bodies. And it only takes one of them to block legislation. In contrast, in parliamentary systems, it usually just takes one elected body to pass a law, not three. As we've seen, most of them are unicameral or effectively unicameral, with only one legislative body having the responsibility to pass laws. Prime minister is extremely unlikely to block legislation because he or she is elected by the majority party or party coalition who passes the laws in the first place. Because of this, parliamentary systems can pass needed legislation much more efficiently than a separation of power system. Since our legislative system suffers from a built-in tendency toward gridlock, it is often unable to address many of the pressing problems faced by the nation. For example, gridlock has made it very difficult to pass important laws in areas like gun control that have been acted upon effectively by parliamentary democracies. Consider the following. March 15, 2019, in Christchurch, New Zealand, a gunman used a semi-automatic assault rifle to kill 51 people in two mosques. The government's response, less than a month later, 
the New Zealand parliament passed a law banning those military style guns. April 10th, 2020, a man used an assault style weapon to kill 22 people in Nova Scotia, Canada. The government's response, three weeks later, those weapons were banned. In the US since 1999, semi-automatic assault rifles have been used in over a quarter of all mass shootings, accounting for 40% of the deaths, 608 people, 69% of the injuries, 987 people. Uh, the government's response here, nothing, nothing. Congress has not moved to ban these weapons. And the difference here is not because these other countries have anti-gun cultures. Canada has very minimal gun control regulations. The difference is that these other countries have governments that are more responsive to their citizens. In the US, gridlock undermines this responsiveness and it weakens democracy. Now, when most Americans think of gridlock, they don't blame our governmental system. They blame instead increased party polarization. They suggest that the parties have grown too far apart and too acrimonious to easily agree upon policies. But studies show that party polarization is actually higher in most European democracies, and yet they do not suffer from gridlock. The majority party or coalition of parties in a parliament can still easily pass legislation. Polarization turns out to be a problem only when it occurs in a separation of power system that is already prone to stalemate. As Americans, we are taught that the separation of powers is a good thing, that it is a politically neutral safeguard that ensures that no one group gets too much power. This is a myth. In reality, this arrangement strongly increases the power of conservative interests and the gridlock it creates as a pernicious ideological and class bias. Gridlock tends to preserve the status quo and inhibit change. This works to the advantage of well-off interests because it is they who are benefiting from most of the current status quo. Think about the rich who don't want to have their taxes raised or the corporations that don't want to be regulated. To stop an increase in taxes or regulation, they only have to kill a bill in one subcommittee in either the House or the Senate or in one full committee or in a floor vote in either body or they can have the president veto it. So they only have to win once to block a bill. But the road to victory for those who want to increase taxes or regulation is much harder. They have to win in every subcommittee, every full committee, and each floor vote, a vote in, each, in both houses, and also convince the president not to veto the bill. Generally speaking, it is those who are not doing well in society, the poor, the sick, minorities, the victims of pollution, jobless, and so on. Those are the people who need things to change. A system designed to discourage change and protect the status quo does not work in their interests. Gridlock favors the winners in societies, not the losers. And it gives the advantage to special interest groups like the wealthy and corporations who want to block reforms or the majority of citizens who often want to pass those reforms. A bias toward gridlock is also a conservative bias toward limited government and against large activist government. The separation of powers makes it harder to pass large government programs and tax increases necessary for activist government to address the serious uh, economic, social, and environmental problems that we face. And it's one of the reasons we lag behind Europe, the size of our public sector, 
in why our retirement and social welfare programs are comparatively underfunded and less effective. The decision of whether to have a large or small government should be made by voters in elections, by their choosing either a liberal or a conservative government. And that's the way it works in parliamentary democracies. But in the United States, this decision is predetermined by constitutional structures like the separation of powers. And that's not democratic. To make things worse, there is a second way that the separation of powers frustrates democracy. The ease of blocking bills in the system not only stops vital legislation from passing, it also undermines the effectiveness of the legislation that does manage to pass. We have, for instance, passed some laws to reform campaign financing and to control guns, but these laws have generally been minimal, weak, and ineffective. Why is that? It's because in a separation of power system, successful bills must make their way through a gauntlet of three different institutions where they must be repeatedly compromised and watered down. The strongest part of a bill are often eliminated, please all the various lawmakers and interests who could block that particular piece of legislation. Take the area of poverty policy. A 2019 OECD study uh, of 37 Western nations found that the US had a poverty rate of 17.8%. All of the other 36 countries had lower rates than we do. And 12 of them had less than half of our poverty rate. We lag behind in this area largely because US anti-poverty policies are weaker and more piecemeal than they are in European parliamentary democracies. In part, this is a result of there being many more opportunities in our system for watering down or compromising these policies. One study found a clear relationship between the number of veto points in a government, that is, the number of institutions where a bill can be blocked, and the level of poverty and economic inequality in a country. Countries with more veto points, like the United States, have more economic inequality and higher numbers of children and the elderly in poverty. And there's a third serious drawback to separations of powers. It makes it harder to hold the government accountable, an important process in a democratic system. Accountability usually means the ability to get rid of current law policymakers when the public is dissatisfied with them. But with three separate institutions involved in policymaking, it becomes difficult for the public to identify who exactly to blame for policy inaction or policy failure. A Democratic House will blame a Republican Senate and vice versa. And both will blame the president will return the favor. MSNBC will tell people the Republicans are the problem and Fox News will blame the Democrats. So when the public goes to the polls, who do they take their displeasure out on? And even if most voters want to throw a party out of power, they can't do it here in one election because there are staggered terms. Two years for the House, four years for the president, and six years for the Senate. This means it takes several elections over many years for the makeup of the federal government to reflect changing political opinion among the public. In contrast, in parliamentary systems, it's perfectly clear who is responsible for policymaking. It's the ruling majority coalition and their elected prime minister and they can all be changed in one election. Now that's what I call a caterpillar. Okay, that's the case against the separation of powers. What about the arguments in favor 
uh, of this arrangement. The main argument usually offered in defense of it is that it prevents tyranny of the majority. Separating the powers of government makes it harder for it to pass oppressive laws, harder for the majority to run roughshod over the rights of minorities. For example, if the Senate passed legislation that discriminated against uh, Islamic Americans, the House could block it or the president could be over. But there are a number of problems with this tyranny of the majority argument. First of all, if this is correct, we would expect parliamentary countries without our checks and balances to be plagued by bad laws that often oppress minorities. But this is not the case. For example, one might expect parliamentary countries to do much worse in preventing government from violating basic political rights and civil liberties. But the evidence shows otherwise. A Freedom House study has found that 17 Western European parliamentary democracies actually score higher in protecting freedoms than the United States. This suggests that a separation of powers is not necessary to, to protect the rights of minorities in society. But there's an even more fundamental problem with this gridlock prevents tyranny of the majority argument. Separation of power institutionalizes something even worse, tyranny of the minority. This system makes it easy for small political minorities and special interests to consistently block the will of the legitimate majority of citizens. The United States is the land of minority rule. Employers can block bills that would facilitate union organizing. Oil, gas, and coal companies can prevent passage of legislation to slow down global warming. Still, many Americans seem obsessed with the idea of preventing government from doing bad things, and that a separation of powers helps to do that. Even Democrats who we've seen are systematically disadvantaged by this arrangement, will often celebrate the separation of powers, especially when it allows them to, uh, let's say, torpedo what they see as a destructive Republican bill. But this obsession with preventing bad government blinds people to an important fact. Making it hard for government to do bad things also makes it hard for government to do the good things that improve our lives, like solving societal problems. A government that is too hobbled to hurt people is also too hobbled to help them when they need it. Okay, so what can we do to fix all of these problems caused by our separation of powers system? Well, unfortunately, the only real structural solution, switching to a parliamentary system, is simply not in the cards. We could get rid of the filibuster. That would be great, would be helpful. But this would still leave in place the whole checks and balances system, which is at the heart of this problem. I know that some people are hoping that having the Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the presidency are relatively rare you know, occurrence, will result in less gridlock and stronger and more progressive laws. I hope that's the case. But there are reasons to not be too optimistic about this. Last two times this happened, 2009 to 2010 under Obama, 93 to 94 under Clinton, not a lot of progressive legislation was passed. And today we should keep in mind that it only takes a handful of conservative Democrats in the House, or one conservative Democrat in the Senate, to stop any attempts at strong legislation by the Democrats. Witnesses uh, Congress's recent difficulties trying to enact a $15 minimum wage law. Now, the good news is that it is possible to enact reform for many of the other systemic failures 
I mentioned earlier, such as the Electoral College, campaign financing, uh, winner take all, and so on. These are problems that we can fix. And that is why there are many activist organizations working on those problems. And, and there's a list of these groups uh, on my website uh, if you want to join them or support their efforts. We do need to address these failures of American democracy because we are paying the price for these failures every day in terms of inferior government services and unaddressed societal problems. Falling behind in democracy has meant the U.S has fallen behind other countries in responding to public demands to tackle the pressing challenges of our aging. For instance, governments in most other leading Western democracies do a much, much better job in all of the following issue areas. Let me go to a slide again here. I will just let you read these to yourself. Now, given this, it should not be surprising to learn that there is some compelling evidence that people in parliamentary systems feel better off than those in separation of powers countries. Now, obviously, there are a lot of factors that affect the level of happiness in countries, but it turns out that the structure of government does play a role in this. A study of 21 advanced democracies found, quote, clear and robust evidence in support of the contention that people lead more satisfying lives in democracies with parliamentary systems. In the United States, the level of public frustration with the government remains very high. Polls show that most Americans want to see government do more to address our serious problems. For example, 75% of people want government to force business to reduce greenhouse gases. 70% want stricter assault weapons laws. 64% want the federal government to make higher education more available and affordable. And 75% want a higher minimum wage. But our government has consistently failed to enact the policies that the public wants, an indication that something is deeply wrong with our democracy. In conclusion, many people on the left tend to blame the Republican for all of this. And of course, there's a lot of truth to that. But it is also important to see that much of the problem lies deep in the very institutions of our government, institutions that undermine democracy and enable conservatives and special interests to frustrate the will of the public. Only by reforming these flawed institutions can we create a truly democratic system of government, a government of, by, and for the people of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, that was wonderful. Um, well argued, stimulating, thoughtful. Um, I wish we could clap. One of the limits of Zoom is whenever we try to clap, it doesn't work very well. So just imagine we're all clapping really hard. Oh, no, no. <laughs> um, now I want to make I want to announce <clears throat> the next two speakers in March. The first one is March 12. That's Marshall Carpell. His talk is titled "MRNA Proteins and Lipids: Oh My, Making Sense of COVID and the Vaccines." And then on March 26, Jeff Sessinger is going to give a talk called late, titled "What is the heck? What the heck is palliative care? Palliative care might be the most important thing for you to get when you or your loved ones face serious illness." Um, we we have talks every every other week from three to four, and we want you to join us. Um, and now just a little word from. Our sponsor, us, Northampton Neighbors. 
as I mentioned, unlike other vill villages, there are no dues for any of our services or social opportunities. Um, but we do have expenses. We have to get funds from someplace. So we know times are tough for many people. If you can, we hope you'll, you'll make a contribution to this terrific organization. Go to www.northhampton.neighbors.org and you can pay, give a contribution. Any size will be appreciated on PayPal through credit card, or you can mail us um, a check at PO Box 231 Northampton, Massachusetts, and you will see this on the, on the website. Um, and now Nina is going to put up uh, the, uh, the links to, to Doug's um, uh, website. And I'm going to, I'll put them in the, in the chat as well um, before the end of the talk. Um, and so now we want to go to the question and answer. Um, I think Doug asked me to moderate, so we've already got a bunch of what look like really interesting questions. So I'll just um, turn to these. Should I do that, Doug? Or do you want to? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Rachel Naismith says the structural problems you cite, including the Constitution, etc., make me very pessimi pessimistic about changing the status quo. What can we do as concerned citizens that can be effective in creating significant change? That's, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, that, the fact that we have the hardest constitution uh, in the world to change is a serious problem for you know, a lot of different kinds of reforms because a lot of the things that you want to address, uh, at least some of them are in the constitution. So if you wanted to put like term limits on uh, Supreme Court justices, for example, that's gonna require a, a constitutional amendment. Um, but there actually are a number of things that we can do that don't necessarily require constitutional change. Um, I mean, I, I, the area I specialized in in my work was voting systems. Um, and you know, we can certainly change voting systems, certainly on the city and state level and on the federal level as well without um, any kind of uh, constitutional amendment being necessary. In fact, we just had a uh, uh, referendum in Massachusetts I, I to go to ranked choice I voting. You know, we, you know, I can't, what am I gonna Lost out, like um, but it was close. Um, and it's important uh, to realize that, uh, you know, we can have some of these changes without addressing uh, necessarily the constitutional obstacles. Uh, another good example of that would be the national uh, popular vote plan which is, is, is kind of complicated. I'm not gonna get into the whole explanation here. You can read about it on my site. It's a way of getting around the electoral college. Uh, again, if you wanna get rid of the electoral college, it has to be an amendment. It's really hard to do, but this is a scheme for using an interstate compact uh, to sort of make sure that states actually cast their votes for whoever wins the popular vote. Very clever scheme. It gets around these uh, constitutional issues. So. Uh, there are there are changes that we can make. Um, uh, campaign finance reform is another area where a bunch of people are, are trying things like matching fund schemes or uh, other kinds of things uh, that we certainly can make progress on um, and not worry about that constitutional obstacle. Okay, here's another one. It's from Mark Carpell. He says, Doug, thank you. A terrific eye-opening talk. Is it possible to track the progression of gridlock over American history? Ooh, that's a big question. Waxing and waning, worse and worse until our time, other? Oh, yeah, that's, mm, let me think about that. That's, that's actually a very fascinating question um, because there have been periods of time when gridlock has been sort of overcome. I mean, the tendency is built into, the, into it, you know, it's there all the time. But there have been times in history, in American political history, where we've overcome that and there's been a flurry of important legislation passing through Congress relatively quickly, mostly very um, uh, progressive kinds of uh, uh, bills. And those two periods were basically the 1930s and the 1960s. And what made that possible um, was large scale social movements. There was a lot of public unrest. 
Uh, in the 1930s, you know, there was a lot of uh, organizing around the union movement um, and around poverty issues. Um, and there was an incredible uh, pressure coming from the bottom up on government that they had to do something, you know, about the Great Depression and all the problems caused by that. Um, and similarly, in the 1960s, we saw a whole range of very strong social movements, you know, the civil rights movement, uh, the women's movement, in the later 60s, there's the environmental movement, and there are all sorts of, you know, uh, important social movements. It's a little bit like, uh, the way I talk about it in my class is that, you know, the separation of powers system sort of, it's like uh, a, a big door, the government's a big rusty door, right? And you're trying to get in and, you, you know, you're trying to push on the door, um, but, you, you know, you can't get in. It takes an enormous amount of public power pushing on that door and pushing on government and keeping the power on government uh, and people in Congress and the president um, to be able to push through those kinds of legislation, uh, 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 sort of spates of legislation. Um, so it's possible for us to, uh, say, um, push through the problems of good law, but it has to come from the bottom up. And it has to be a well-organized, and sometimes it has to be, you know, a, a movement that that is, is very strong and might even take decades. But, um, but that's, I think, that's kind of how it's worked in the past. Okay, there, there are a lot of questions. I'm getting a little confused about the order, so I'm just going to read what's in front of me. Um, where does the court system, particularly the Supreme Court, fit? It? This is from Dale. Fit into right. this narrative of eliminating the separation of powers, and how does the state state system of separation of powers feed this? Well, I'll, I'll just focus on the on the Supreme Court. Um, I didn't talk much about that. Um, I mean, the, what I focused on was the was the uh, separation of powers, sort of in the legislative process, right? So I was talking about the House, the Senate, and the President, but clearly we also have um, a separation of powers. Uh, with this other branch, which is in court. And again, I, there, there's a, a, a lot on my site about this, so I refer you to that. Uh, but I'll just give you a, a short version, which is that um, we have um, in the United States probably the strongest Supreme Court of any Western democracy. That is, they have the power to interfere in the democratic process more than any other court in, in terms of overturning actions of Congress and uh, actions of the president. That, and again, we're sort of an outlier on the far end of that in giving uh, the Supreme Court so much power. In fact, some people are, have argued that we're kind of headed toward a juristocracy, you know, because it seems like there's so many areas in which the final decision on policies in the United States, it ends up in the Supreme Court, nine unelected people there's nothing we can do about it. Interesting, if you look comparatively at other, at other countries, particularly Western European countries, uh, some of them, not, not a lot of them, but some of them uh, allow their um, uh, parliaments to override decisions by their Supreme Courts. They believe that the ultimate interpretation of the Constitution should be made by elected officials, not by these nine unelected people. Um, so that's an interesting alternative. Uh, most of the other countries also put a limit on the kinds of issues that the Supreme Court can look at. They can't just look at everything. Um, and also, just the final thing is that uh, the Supreme Courts in a lot of other countries tend to be much more um, reluctant to overthrow laws. Uh, only they, they tend to only do it in the most, most extreme situations, rather than on kind of a daily basis, the way that our, our court does. So even in that, you know, even when you compare us, you know, just on the judicial part, we tend to be, as I said, kind of on the far end of the spectrum and, and, and different than other kinds of Western democracies. Okay, here's a question from Fran, Fran Deutsch. He says, great talk, Doug. Question, Thanks, Fran. What do you think of quasi-independent regulatory agencies like the Federal Reserve and the SEC? Do these add to gridlock? Does the US have more of these than other democracies? Should we do something about them? Uh, yes, no, no, yes. <laughs> uh, let me elaborate. Um, I, I, I don't think they add to gridlock so much, but they do pose a problem for democracy. 
know, because again, you have unelected people making extremely important economic policy decisions that have vast impacts on, on the lives of Americans. Um, so for, you know, for decades and decades and decades, uh, the Federal Reserve, you know, was obsessed with stopping inflation and didn't seem to really care much at all about, you know, the jobless rate. You know, a high number of jobless, who cares? At least we don't have inflation. That's a policy decision. You know, that they that this was made by this you know, sort of quasi public uh, uh, body. I think those kinds of decisions should be made by elected officials. Um, so, yeah, you could probably add that to my list of, you know, uh, kind of problems that we have with our democracy in the United States. Okay. Um from John Hoff, what is your thinking about adding many seats to the Supreme Court to avoid major political swings by the seating of just one or two justices? Oh, that's a tough one. I, you know, I haven't really thought a whole lot about the whole court stacking thing. Um, no, I don't know. Um, so I'm allowed to say you don't know. What? You're allowed to say you don't know. Yeah, it's it's one I, I kind of I, I know a little bit about it. I mean, the, the thing I talk about on my website, which maybe addresses part of what he's, he's getting at, um, though not the kind of court, you know, not the kind of super conservative court we've ended up with now, um, is term limits for for uh, justices. And what one of the things that does it, it not only makes sure that somebody's not on the court for forty years, um, but it also means the way it's usually set up is that every president gets to have one appointment for each of the terms that they serve. And because that's one of the problems with the current way it works now is that depending on timing and who dies and who decides to quit, you know, there are some presidents that have, I don't know, lots of appointments, therefore lots of influence. And there's other presidents that have very few appointments. I mean, now we're, we're kind of in trouble, you know, that, that uh, if, you, if you're on the left, you realize that you know the last three appointments have all been made by the Trump administration, um, so that would kind of help solve that problem. But um, I would have to think about the court stacking stuff. Okay, I think we only have time for one more question, um, and I think Nina Kleinberg deserves it. She wrote, "Doug, can you address the issue of who wrote the Constitution, what they thought of democracy, and why the, they wrote the Constitution they did?" Yes, uh, and uh, uh, I keep doing this, slugging myself, but th there's a whole article about this on the site. Um, the, uh, the short version is that the founders um, and the framers of the Constitution were not all that excited about real democracy. Uh, they were very nervous about uh, average people. They kind of saw them as an uneducated mob. They thought it'd be much better if political and economic and social elites ran things. That's who they were. Um, so they wrote a constitution. I mean, they didn't want to go back you know, to uh, you know, rule by kings. So that was good. But they didn't want to go to any sort of radical democracy where people had all the power. So they, they created a system in which people were isolated from uh, power on the federal system. And the easiest way to see this and to see where their values were it's just to think about, you know, we have the Supreme Court, we have the presidency, we have the House, we have the Senate. We have, those are the four main bodies of the uh, federal government that they created. Only one did they have elected by the public. Okay, um, I'm gonna put the two uh, uh, links for, the, for Doug's website on the, chat. Um, and Nina also will put it up. For some reason, I'm having trouble copying them. There we go. Okay, terrific. Here they are. Um, and you can also just search Doug Amy and find them or search Northampton Neighbors or email. We also put them on uh, the invitation. So thank you, Doug. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, we thank very you. much fun. appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, there are lots of other good questions and I apologize to those of you who I didn't, I didn't get to them.
Um, but uh, you can't, as Doug said, uh, can, can, you can see the answers to many of them on his two websites. So thank you and come to our next one by Marshall Carpell in two weeks. Bye everybody. Hmm. <laughs>